As a journalist for many years in Saskatchewan, Dale Eisler has witnessed the transition of the province we both call home and love from have-not status to commodity superstore. Energy, agriculture, potash, oil, canola, minerals, that next year country has become the it place. Dale's new book, From Left to Right, Saskatchewan's Political and Economic Transformation, is the product of that lived experience of 26 years in journalism, of 16 years in Ottawa and a variety of departments and political offices, as Consul General for Canada in Denver, and now at the University of Regina as the Senior Policy Fellow at the Johnson Shoyama School of Public Policy, named for two powerful Ottawa Mandarins that actually came from Saskatchewan. Dale, welcome. Hi, Pam. Pleasure to be with you. And congratulations. This is really um, an amazing read. And I don't think just for those of us who live and love uh, Saskatchewan, I think it says a lot about the politics of um, of our country. So we want to start with the, kind of the basic premise here that once the birthplace of Canadian socialism, Saskatchewan has actually become a centre for Canadian conservatism over sort of 40 years. But you also say this is not that big an ideological jump as one might think. It has more about the people and the place. That's right. Uh, I think that... Um... Uh, Saskatchewan people, uh, and I, you know this as well as any anybody, Pam. Saskatchewan people are at their sort of their core, their heart, are pretty pragmatic people who will respond to you know reality as they see it, and yeah. and uh, you know take the action necessary. So I don't think Saskatchewan people see themselves as overly ideological, and uh, uh, but the province itself has had this identity, and and rightly so. Of being sort of the, the 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 home of socialism in Canada. I mean, the Douglas government in 1944 was the first democratically elected socialist government in Canada. So Canada, so that really kind of imprinted the province identity, and and others saw it that way, uh, with uh, you know good reason because of the nature of of the government at the time. But uh, uh, if you look at the you know the Douglas government's record, it was pretty pragmatic. There were periods mm -hmm. where they were you know particularly their first term where they engaged in a lot of sort of uh, public ownership and uh, crown corporation development. But after that, I mean, after that first term, they tended to sort of back away from it. And then, of course, there was Medicare, which was a yeah. hugely important issue for, for Saskatchewan and Canada. And that further created the, the you know, the, the, the identity of Saskatchewan as a left-wing kind of province. But the reality, of course, is that Medicare at the time was very much in the mainstream of Canadian thought. There was had been federal provincial conferences on how to create a national Medicare system, but there couldn't be agreement on, on you know, cost sharing of of, of such a system. So and, and there still isn't. I just yeah. want to say. Yeah, no, that's right. There still isn't. And and you know, but Douglas decided. He, you know, he was a fiscally conservative premier that he believed the province could afford to do this, and he did it. So, anyways, uh, that's that. But I, I just think that. The, this identity of Saskatchewan as kind of a socialist haven hasn't been entirely accurate. There's some truth right. to it, but I think not, you know, to the extent that many people believe. I remember when I first went east, meaning I moved to Ottawa, um, to the chagrin of my family and friends. They thought I was going into, you know, the clutches of the devil. Most uh, <laughs> most <laughs> kids leaving Saskatchewan went west. Uh, but there I went to Ottawa and I would try to explain to people that NDP governments in Saskatchewan were not the same as what they were seeing in Ontario. And I used to say, look, for decades, people voted for the CCF or the NDP provincially, the Tommy Douglases, but they voted conservative federally. John Diefenbaker from Saskatchewan was the prime minister. Like, those weren't contradictory things. That's very true. I mean, and that's a critical point. And I, I do make reference to that in the book that that provincially people were voting for the uh, CCF NDP for Tommy Douglas. But at the same uh, provincially and, and federally, mm -hmm. you're voting for uh, uh, John Diefenbeck and conservatives. So it was more, I think, uh, uh, what, what really sort of uh, uh, brought that kind of uh, political, uh, uh, you know, attitude together was really driven by populism. 
Diefenbaker was seen as a, very much as a prairie populist himself, and that appealed to Saskatchewan people. He was kind of an outsider in terms yep. of Ottawa and, and central Canada. Uh, and Douglas was a, was a populist, an agrarian populist. So it was really the populism that drove Saskatchewan politics rather than ideology. That's I'm so glad you phrased that because the the book the word is scattered uh, throughout your book in in many contexts as you say agrarian populist or Brad Wall was a popular you know all of these things this has become prairie well populism has become this dirty word now in uh, modern politics and certainly in journalistic circles. Um, but I think you're trying to reclaim it and say, look, we have to see this for what it was originally, which is, you know, reacting to what the population wants. It's not all about Donald Trump. No, that's exactly right. I think the the uh, that's not to say that populism can't be a very corrosive and destructive force yeah. if it's not managed properly. Uh, but I, I, I think so can big, socialism or communism, yeah, you know, <laughs> it, exactly. Populism yeah. it, it isn't sort of bounded by a particular ideology. It, there's there's left wing populism, right wing populism. Right. In populism, you know, in its sort of basic form is the voice of the people. Right. It's, you know, uh, it reflects the democratic will in that sense. Now, there may be times where people are uncomfortable with the democratic will, but nonetheless, <laughs> that's that's what it is. And uh, I think. You know, populism can be a very positive force in politics if it's managed properly. And, uh, you know, there have been examples of that. I think Douglas is a good example, right, where he rallied people around actually the whole sort of the, the, the sort of grounding principles of his populism was social gospel about, you know, people, you know, supporting one another and, you know, building the new Jerusalem, as he, as he called it, you know. So it depends what form it takes. Uh, and we shouldn't be dismissive of it, uh, of it sort of in a, in a completely, you know, blank form. No, a- absolutely. So th- this will come up as we continue our uh, our discussion. Uh, I loved it. I laughed when I saw that you had quoted Arnold uh, Toynbee, the historian, that history is just one damn thing after another. <laughs> <laughs> and And it truly is, because when you think about how the, uh, I know there are people who are going, oh, they're going to talk about Saskatchewan, you know, oh my God, who cares? But it is important because we can see the politics of the country. I don't know if you were in Ottawa in 1980 or not. I was in that room in the Chateau Laurier when Pierre Trudeau, Trudeau Sr., came back to power. Having left, the Joe Clark government was yeah. briefly in office and they fell and the party went back and and recruited Pierre and he gave this famous speech and said, welcome to the eighties. That started a chain of events. And I'm going to look at it through the Saskatchewan eye that really, really changed our life. He came back and he did the, the constitution, the charter of rights, the NEP, uh, the national energy plan, a series of things to which our province and others in the West had to respond and which changed the course of political history. Yeah, very much. I mean, uh, that was a pivotal moment, uh, 1980 and the return of, of Trudeau to power. And it came after the seventies and his government in the seventies when, uh, you know, major events. And I talk about this in the book, so global events more than anything else really mm-hmm. shaped international and domestic and even provincial politics in terms of Saskatchewan, there was the OPEC oil crisis. There were two, two oil shocks during the 1970s, which had profound effects on the Canadian economy. And it, it you know, the federal government, with this rapid increase in, in oil prices, uh, sought to, you know, gain greater access to revenues from, from natural resources, particularly oil, which created this tension between uh, Ottawa, the federal government, and the producing provinces, namely Saskatchewan and, and Alberta. And, um, uh, you know, and during this period, too, was stagflation which took an enormous toll on people. I mean, you, you know, you'll recall, and I certainly do it, interest rates that were like uh, 20%, people were getting 18% mortgage rates, right? Yep. These sorts of things were punishing to people. And this was all sort of unfolding in the, in the 70s and into the early 80s. And I think that had a profound effect on Saskatchewan politics because uh, the Blakeney government was engaged in this defense of, of uh, resources, against Ottawa and was using crown corporations as the means to, to protect Saskatchewan interests uh, so that uh, the federal government couldn't intrude because they were, they were publicly owned by the province. 
at the same time, uh, ordinary people were, were experiencing huge issues because of in interest rates and whatnot. And that led to the populist uprising of Grant Devine. I don't know, uprising is the right word, but the rise of populism under Grant Devine in 1982 and a huge victory for the progressive conservatives to defeat the Blakeney government, which shocked many people. And that issue was really around, I mean, the the CCF and the NDP in particular, and Alan Blakeney was uh, uh, was the overseer of this, along with the Roy Romanos of the world, people that yeah. names people um, may know. But they, that is what they did. They decided they were going to nationalize these resources. Uh, potash, you know, the, we're, we're going to own that and the state is going to run it. And the people are, I mean, cabinet ministers sat on the boards of directors. I mean, that would yeah. be almost unheard of today, but that's yeah. normal. And then Grant Devine, um, leading a conservative party, came in and said, no, you can't make money that way. And we, we need we need to privatize this and get the benefit of the marketplace. Like that was a huge that that was kind of a divide, an ideological divide. It was. I mean, in one sense, that was the sort of the the, the last sort of ideological moment in Saskatchewan politics in some regards. Divine's privatization of, of uh, potash and, and other resource companies that had been nationalized by Blakeney in the 70s. So that was, so the seventies and eighties, in a sense, were were, were framed by uh, ideology, ideology of the left in the seventies, ideology of the right in the eighties. So we had nationalization in the seventies, privatization in the in the eighties. And I make the argument in the book that the privatization agenda, but particularly the privatization of potash, and you know this as well as better than anybody, uh, Pamela, uh, was really significant because potash in Saskatchewan has this kind of iconic stature because we, Saskatchewan has such a tremendous resource of potash, we really kind of can control the global market in terms of production. Uh, and it's always had that kind of a status in people's minds of how important it is. So Blakeney has certainly created an identity for the NDP in the 70s when he nationalized potash. That was seen as a defining moment. And then Divine reverses that 12 or 13 years later with privatization, another defining moment. And I, I believe the NDP really lost its identity with privatization in the 1980s when, when Divine did that. And the party has struggled ever since to reclaim, uh, you know, a central sort of organizing principle or identity. Like, what does the NDP in Saskatchewan, at least, what does it stand for? Yeah. I think that's a very kind of blurry uh, question or answer, uh, and they've never been able to sort of reconcile themselves to that reality. Or or get themselves back in, in power. And then, uh, I mean, the next kind of phase of that then was the, all the, the, the what happened to the Conservative Party and this and that. The, the, what happened then was the, um, the coalition of the willing, as you call it, in a way of the, the liberals and the conservatives coming together, forming the Saskatchewan party and yeah. actually moderating again. Yes. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. I mean, um, the that was in 1999 where mm -hmm. uh, uh, Roman formed a coalition with the liberals, uh, with three liberals, so he could stay in power. Uh, and, and this was at the time when the Saskatchewan party uh, had been formed and was sort of a rising force and um, uh, was was really important. What I say about that moment is that the coalition, I mean, coalitions can make sense uh, in government if it is on the what I call the right side of history. If there is a, a political transition underway and the coalition is reflecting the transition, right, then I think there's greater public acceptance of a coalition government. In this case, it was clearly an attempt by the NDP, the Roman government, to stay in power, right, uh, to resist the forces of change that were happening. And uh, the, the Liberal Party just disappeared effectively because it was subsumed or taken over by the, the, the NDP. And that created this polarized situation of the NDP and the Saskatchewan Party. And the NDP, is, uh, throughout its history, is, has depended a fair amount on, uh, you know, a split of the vote on the right you know, mm -hmm. having liberal and conservative parties, whatever it might be. When it gets uh, polarized in that way, it's a much more difficult situation for them. So that was a very important moment, I believe. I want to carry on with the Saskatchewan party in a moment, but but we're seeing this reflected in Ottawa again, the prime minister's coalition with the NDP yeah. and people making the same arguments today that they did then, which is 
the Canadian population elected a minority government, not a majority government, and you can't get one through the back door. That's right. That's a very good analogy, Pamela, that, uh, uh, you know, are we seeing the same sort of thing federally because of uh, this? It's not an official coalition as it was in Saskatchewan's case, but effectively right. the same sort of thing. And I mean, I, I, I certainly don't understand why the NDP did this, right? <laughs> I think they risk completely. You do. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they risk kind of losing their identity and just uh, kind of becoming kind of irrelevant in terms of the political choice in Canada, which is exactly what happened in Saskatchewan for the Liberal Party when they joined the NDP government uh, as, a, as a coalition. Yep. So it's a good point because, like, uh, is this coalition that not, not a coalition, but the agreement between the Liberals and, and the NDP, is this being seen by the public as an attempt by Trudeau to resist what is a transition that's happening in Canadian politics, right? So I would argue if, if people see it that way, kind of being on the wrong side of history. But we'll we'll find that out, I guess. The Saskatchewan party uh, was an amazing phenomenon in itself. I mean, it's not that strange to have parties get together to try and achieve power or hold power, whatever it is. It's not that strange. But it there was a real um, attitudinal shift in Saskatchewan. And I guess sometimes you see it when you go away and you come back that somehow in, in Saskatchewan, we, we worked hard, we had all of the right values, but we kind of had an idea about ourselves that enough was good enough. Um, if you were, I, there were stories of farmers who were doing well, and if they could buy a Cadillac, they parked it in the city at their son's home. So nobody knew they had that much money yet. You kind of had to wear a hair shirt. And then there was a shift in, in the psychology and, and Brad Wall seemed to capture it, which is, Hey, we're here. We're on the world stage. We're a global player. We're important. Uh, lift your heads up. We don't. Uh, we don't. We don't need to apologize. Yeah, I think that's really true. And, and this brings up a sort of really fundamental point about the transformation of the agricultural economy in Saskatchewan, right. which I think has been maybe the single biggest factor that yep. has driven this this the political and economic transformation of Saskatchewan. And uh, and what you you mentioned is is I think reflective of that 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 over the course of the last forty years or more we've seen um, where uh, order the system of orderly marketing in in terms of rural Saskatchewan has really kind of disappeared. You know, there's no more Canadian Wheat Board. You know, the crow uh, the crow oh, rate is right. gone. The Saskatchewan Wheat Pool is no longer with us. The whole notion of the family farm is not a part of the language of agriculture anymore because farms are much larger. We've only got about just over, I believe the latest numbers, just over 30,000 actual farms in Saskatchewan. I was stunned to read that because yeah. in the thirties and forties, there were, there were four or five times that. Yeah. Well, in the, in the seventies, there were 70,000 farms, yeah. right? So it's been a, a massive kind of transformation uh, demographically in terms of numbers, but also uh, in, this, in the size of farms. And, and as, as one woman I quote in the book says, as farms get larger, towns get smaller, right? right? Uh, and that's really happened in Saskatchewan. And that's created a farm economy where uh, uh, producers themselves are very much personally engaged in the marketing of their products, right? They're no longer working through, you know, farm organizations like, like the wheat pool, whatever it might be. They now directly, you know, sell their, their uh, their crops to uh, to grain companies and they're you know computer literate and so they're or very internationally much, they're dealing yeah, directly exactly. with purchasers yeah. Yeah. so they're very engaged in the marketing of their so yeah. it, it, the whole ethic of farming has changed a lot from a collectivist culture to a far more individualistic one mm -hmm. and that's been I think at the basis of the political transformation in rural Saskatchewan where this where the Saskatchewan party is utterly dominant where, and yeah. you know at one time the NDP was very Powerful in rural Saskatchewan. In the rural Saskatchewan. It, yeah. it just reminds me, Pierre Elliott Trudeau saying, why should I sell your wheat? They, yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> they kind of took it literally and said, okay, you don't have to. We'll do it. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, exactly. And I, I mean, uh, that, that was a moment in, it was actually in Regina uh, yeah. in, in 69. And, uh, you know, it was a rhetorical sort of comment. But I think it, it, it kind of signaled a little bit about the psychology 
how things yeah. were changing. And some farmers even seized on it. We saw the rise of more market-oriented farm organizations. What does it mean, though? And we, we've just kind of mentioned it there, but with the rise of, you know, the you refer to it as kind of creative destruction, which is what we see in the corporate world. Fewer farms equals bigger farms equals prosperity for fewer, but more for yeah. the province. But then you see the death and decline of that rural culture. Uh, the small towns where everything happened in a church basement or at the Legion Hall or, yeah. you know, now everybody has to jump in their car and go to the nearest big city to go to a big box store and buy what they want. Like it, it comes with a huge downside as well. It does. I mean, uh, and you know, you know, small town Saskatchewan from big from Wadena and, and, yeah. and whatnot. And, what, and I don't know what the effect's been in your community in terms of how visible it is, but certainly yeah. um, it, it, it's a completely different kind of society now. Uh, and the culture has changed. And as you say, you know, meeting in church basements and small community groups, I mean, there's still some of that, but yeah. not to the extent that it, it, it used to be because um, the nature of the farm economy is so different, right? Uh, these, are, these are in many cases agribusinesses. Uh, and sure. uh, yeah, and, and that has had a profound effect. And I would say, just sort of in, in political terms, and I talk about this in the book, I think the NDP has uh, really failed at re at, at ras or reconciling itself to that new farm economy. I don't think it's ever figured it out, you mm -hmm. know, because they were very much rooted in orderly marketing, right, and yeah. the co-op movement and these sorts of values that you were talking about. And as, as those have dissipated and disappeared because of the changed farm economy, the NDP has never sort of reconciled themselves to that. So, so what is their policy uh, yeah. in terms of, of agriculture in Saskatchewan? Uh, and I don't know, maybe it's, it's a failing on my part, but I have no idea. And I think the vast majority of people in rural Saskatchewan couldn't tell you what the NDP farm policy is. And they need to figure that out if they hope to, I think, rebuild out there. When you look at things and, and, and it, it, place off that because if you were going to um, nationalize things like potash that you, you know, that happened and then the unnationalization, the privatization of that, you know, when you look at it in today's terms, I mean, this is a key strategic resource. We look at what's going on in Ukraine and the Russian invasion. And there are, you know, we have a huge diaspora in Saskatchewan. There are a lot of Ukrainians in, in my town and, and my community. And you see the resulting effect of that, that if you, if they don't put their wheat and barley into the system, and if we have nowhere to sell our potash and we're talking about food shortages and inflation already and yeah. and we're just at the beginning of of this crisis um you you see that people are much more engaged on that level they're talking about those issues in the news and how it affects what they do for a living every day um and that they need and want to have more control over that that's right. I mean, if you look at it, uh, I mean, it, ironically, what's happening in Ukraine, the terrible tragedy of Ukraine and the horrors that we're witnessing actually, you know, creates something of an opportunity for Saskatchewan, too, because of, you know, wheat prices are are have yep. been rising significantly because of the uncertainty around Ukraine wheat production and also Russia, which is a major wheat producer. And the isolation economically now of Russia is opening up uh, a grain market. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, that that Saskatchewan could profit a lot from. And I think people sort of see the op opportunity there. And uh, at the same time, we talked about potash and the importance of potash to Saskatchewan. And it's a you know fertilizer that's used around the world in agriculture. And mm -hmm. we're facing this challenge now of producing enough uh, crops and wheat uh, to feed the world because of what's going on in Europe. And uh, Russia, Belarus, is a big producer of potash, and they've also been isolated. Yeah. So that's opening up that market for Saskatchewan. So it's, it, there is a great economic opportunity in one sense coming out of the adversity that we're seeing in Ukraine for this part of, uh, of Canada. And the other side of it is, and, and this goes back again on, on the topic of energy and the NEP at a time when we're supposedly trying to help Europe uh, end its reliance on Russian oil and gas. We're not able to do much helping because we don't have any pipelines to get our product to the places that need it. And right. that too is putting us in the center of today's news. 
Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And a, a, a great example of that is uh, is LNG, liquid natural gas. Mm -hmm. Canada has tremendous reserves of, of natural mm -hmm. gas, and Europe is going to need it uh, desperately because of the embargo on on uh, Russian uh, gas, and we have no capacity to get it there. I mean, we would have to go from uh, um, you know the east coast most logically rather than the west coast and we're li very limited on the west coast what we can do there's a big lng plant being built at kitimat but that's still two years away from from operation and there's nothing on the on the east coast so um even though we have this natural resource we're kind of stymied in terms of getting it to this world market that desperately needs it because of what's going on in europe so it's an oppor a missed opportunity for canada right now unless we can accelerate our ability to get this to market. You, the, the thread you've drawn in the book that the, there are issues around which politics coalesces and then it changes directions and, and it happens to parties, but it happens with these things like the invasion of Ukraine. It happens with the NEP, uh, you know, the federal government, and, and you have unlikely partners, uh, Peter Lougheed, the conservative in Alberta, and Alan Blakeney, the socialist in Saskatchewan, joining forces to say, you can't take our resources. And, and that was kind of a big shift in, in our relationship to the rest of the country, in a sense. And again, we're seeing that play out with the energy and climate change discussion. Um, and one of the statistics you cite, Alberta's energy sector contributes $76 billion to the GDP. The auto sector in Ontario contributes $16 billion. Like, yet the auto industry is always part of the federal political discussion, and we've seen it again recently, whereas the energy sector isn't always as um, recognized, accepted, and respected in Ottawa. Yeah, that's very true. And I, I think the, the, the numbers you cite are, are critically important, and people tend not to, uh, I think, fully realize the significance of the energy sector, particularly oil and gas, in terms of our exports and what it means for the Canadian dollar. Uh, and as we transition out of fossil fuels, and it's going to be you know, a, a several-decade transition, yeah. We have to realize that we're losing that export revenue. And Canada's wealth uh, throughout our history has been built on our, our natural resources, our export of our natural resources. That's our comparative advantage. That's what we have that the world needs. And that's what's given us our, our high, high standard of living. Now, if we're going to simply you know, phase out of exporting oil and gas to the world market, that's still going to need it, maybe not in the same uh, magnitude, but there's still going to be demand for it. What are we going to replace that with? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we don't have any comparative advantages in, in other areas, particularly. Uh, and this is a huge, huge economic and, and monetary issue for Canada, because, the, you know, without that uh, foreign currency that we, we earn with those exports, the, Canadian, the value of the Canadian dollar would plummet. And then what effect does that have on, you know, inflation and standard of living in Canada? So this is, a, you know, a big issue. It's easy to talk about transitioning away from yep. oil and gas. But what is the reality of that? What does that actually mean for the Canadian economy? And what do we replace that with? I, I, I was listening to Christy Clark the other day, former premier of BC, and she just was in this discussion about, you know, we've got to get out of oil and gas and we've got to get all our, our green replacements. And she just paused and said, OK, that's great. I, I hope you're prepared to give up health care because that's what funds it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, 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 that's exactly right. Uh, and I guess the point is, as we talk about, you know, the climate issue, which is, you know, a very critical issue, and we have to address and be part of sort of an international, you know, uh, effort here, but yep. we have to have our eyes open. So what does it mean for us to do this? And we talk about like a just transition, which means, you know, people are, are going to, you know, get employment elsewhere. Well, those are nice sounding words, but let's, yeah. you know, uh, how exactly is that going to happen? And specifically, what does it mean fiscally for Canada and economically? And, you know, we tend to not go there because I think governments don't really uh, confront it because they know that uh, the reality is not going to be something that Canadians are going to welcome. No, I mean, this notion that we're going to turn all the folks that work on the rigs into coders is just, you know, 
yeah. like not realistic. Okay. I raised the issue in part because of how big, and, and again, it's one of these micro issues that has um, major implications. The carbon tax has been a much bigger issue for people in Saskatchewan, in the West in general, but in Saskatchewan, because it impacts everything. Um, in the first place, we're both producers and consumers, so, so you get it kind of twice. But, you know, it's grain drying, the impact on every farm, whether there's going to be another tax on trucks. I mean, it just goes on. It feels like this is another one of those big issues like the NEP. Yeah, well, I think uh, certainly in political terms, it's got that dimension to it. I, I, I don't know if it's as, at this point as acute as the NEP was, but it's it's certainly um, an issue that uh, people here struggle with. Many people here struggle with. I think yeah. you can certainly make the economic argument that if you're if you're serious about climate change and you want to change people's behavior, a, a, a carbon tax, a carbon price is the proper economic tool to do it. Right. That's how you will affect change. Right. Uh, but. Uh, as you say, in Saskatchewan, this has uh, kind of unique effects because we're we're an energy producer here, so it's, so you have that that side of it. But in terms of agriculture, I mean, yeah. um, inputs uh, often involve you know products that uh, are you know energy intensive, and you know will face the tax. And the other thing too is fertilizer is uh another one that that's produces, the big one uh, yeah. yeah exactly produces uh ghgs the production of, of fertilizer and if there's an expectation that farms are going to have to reduce their ghgs to less fertilizer that has then big effects on production in terms of how much you actually can produce and our capacity so, to feed the world which is what uh, that's doing. right exactly <laughs> so it's it's it, these things are all interconnected and complicated and uh um I think that uh, Saskatchewan people are still um, far from comfortable with uh, a carbon price. I mean, it's not kind of a, a visceral thing for people particularly, but it's growing in intensity. The the premier makes much of this that other provinces have been allowed to do their own thing, to find a, a way to... Um, exercise the same, uh, be, you know, force a behavior change on people and they can find a way to do it. And that there is a made in Saskatchewan policy and it's carbon capture and it's plans for many nuclear reactors and oh. the hydrogen and all of these things and that it's not being accepted. Is, is that a, a fair assessment? I think it is. I mean, certainly that's the argument that the uh, the government, the Scott Moe government makes here. And they do have uh, their resilience plan, they call it, in terms of, mm -hmm. of climate change. But it it, uh, it does not employ a, a widely applied uh, carbon price. It's more focused on large emitters, right, mm -hmm. uh, putting limits on their emissions. So it, uh, I mean, the argument of the, of the federal government is that it doesn't, you know, have will have the results necessary to reduce GHGs to the extent that's required. In this province, we have a very high per capita uh, GHG uh, level, right? Uh, because of the need, well, our population and then yeah, people are yeah, farmers. Yeah, population. yeah, and farmers. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, you know, I, I understand the federal position. They, they believe a carbon price is absolutely critical, a cornerstone of climate policy, and you need to have it applied across Canada. Um, you know, I get that, but in Saskatchewan, the, the sense is that it, it unfairly singles out this province. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they've come up with what they think is a, is a plan that could be, you know, sufficient. Uh, federal government doesn't agree. And uh, where this is going to uh, end up is uh, anybody's guess. I, yeah. I wouldn't doubt that the, the next provincial election will, might not be fought in large measure around the issue of a carbon price in a position to take against the, the federal government. The the politics and and we just touched on it briefly about the impact of of Bradwall and the uh, Saskatchewan party and and people wanted to recruit him for the federal conservative leadership. Um, I remember having that conversation with Peter Lougheed way back when, and he said, you don't go from provincial politics to Ottawa, particularly in the West. It undoes everything you've done at home, and you'll never be accepted by the central Canadian 
media and elites and all of those things. He chose not to. And some of the things we hear from him now talking about things like the Buffalo party and, and maybe a coalition again, more formally between Alberta and Saskatchewan on these resource issues. He's not talking about separation, but many others are. What's your take on what is actually going on? Well, I think, I mean, um, shortly after he stepped on as premier, uh, uh, Brad Wall got involved with a group, many of them from Saskatchewan who live in Alberta in creation of the, and I talk about this, the Buffalo Project, right? Which uh, was uh, an attempt to form a group that could speak for Saskatchewan and Alberta on a national stage, not a political party, but just a, right. a kind of an advocacy group within the context of federalism, right? That this would not be yeah. some separatist movement. It would be a, it's kind of a regional voice. And, you know, and it harkens back to, and you've talked about it, Pamela, and I do in the book too, about Lougheed and Blakeney. Yeah. I mean, together, those two in the 70s and uh, early 80s, they, they were, uh, uh, you know, a coalition. They, they, they formed a voice for Alberta and Saskatchewan, and people saw them very much for that. They maybe had different uh, approaches to how they addressed the issue in terms of, uh, you know, investment. Uh, Lougheed was more seeing private investment to develop resources, Blakeney saw it more as public ownership, right? But the, it was all about defending the interests of the two provinces. And I think people felt in those days that the West was well represented. Those two voices were highly regarded. Uh, and I think the feelings now is that there isn't the same sort of voice for the two provinces on the federal stage. And that's what they thought Brad Wall could bring in. He did engage for a time on this, but he's actually you know, drawn back from it. Um, and uh, the Buffalo Project, so-called, hasn't been all that active. And Brad himself says that, uh, you know, he, he his level of engagement now has is, is been reduced a lot. And they're more of a fundraising group now uh, on uh, to speak out on, on, on issues. But there was a serious attempt to get him to take a really sort of big role in terms of being a uh, a voice for the region on the on the national stage, and I think he was a little uncomfortable with that because of the potential for it to be seen as some kind of Western separatist movement, which he didn't want any part of. What do you make of of the? And I'm sorry for a message that's going on in the background there. What do you make of the talk of Western separation? Is this is this any way real? Uh, well, it's real. Uh, to what extent? Uh, I don't think it's it's overly significant at this point. But I also don't underestimate it. Uh, you know, we talked about populism, you know, earlier, and this sort of populist sentiment in the West, the sense of alienation in the West, right, which is really rooted in in the history of of this part of the country, uh, and shaped the politics of it. I mean, we saw that. I mean, the CCF was was very much a populist movement in Saskatchewan. Uh, you know, uh, based on, on, you know, agrarian issues and very much, you know, against the so-called elites in Ottawa and big corporate interests like the grain companies and the railways. Yeah. Same thing in Alberta with, with social credit, right? It was a very yeah. populist movement and, and, and spoke to the, the same sorts of issues. Those things haven't gone away. There's still that sense of alienation. So I never want to underestimate the potential of, of something or somebody igniting it. Right or an issue emerges that really captures public imagination. Uh, I don't believe people would go so far as to, you know, really in large numbers go in that direction. But I think there could be, you know, the rise of a party that speaks to Western uh, separatism that uh, becomes a significant factor in politics out here. And and how do you think? I mean, because it's kind of at the root of this, uh, and and you can scratch any Westerner, and they'll have this conversation about Quebec that uh, when there was a threat of separation there, everybody just you know did everything they possibly could and bowed and scraped and changed policies and this and that. And every time there's a hint of this discussion in the West, it's, there's kind of a sneer, which is. Who cares? Go. Nobody else wants you. We don't. And it, it comes back to that issue of not fundamentally understanding the contribution we make to the to the federal purse, which funds all that other stuff. Yeah, you know, that's very true. And that's why I like to the need for a Western voice on this, you know, um, that is heard in other parts of the country. And I think the, uh, you know, the federal government, whether it's the Trudeau government, whomever is in power. Yeah. You've got to take this seriously. 
And you have to, th th this whole uh, reality we have today where the West is really not represented in the federal government, while well, certainly Saskatchewan and Alberta, uh, uh, you know, Saskatchewan has nobody in government and yeah. Alberta only has a couple of seats. I mean, th these are real important issues and, and the federal government's got to pay attention to that and has to be seen as uh, sensitive to Western issues and, and recognizing the importance of, you know, the economic sort of reality of, of this part of the, the country to the national economy. And, and that'll happen at times. Um, and certainly the Trudeau government, you know, on the TMX pipeline issue where they, you know, took it over in our, our building. It's a, you know, that's a clear signal that they see the importance of the uh, uh, oil and gas sector, at least in the, in the uh, medium term to this part of the, uh, of the country. But these things are important. And if if people just focus on sort of where all the majority of votes are, which is in central Canada, yep. at the exclusion of the West, that's dangerous, dangerous stuff. And that's, you know, that's what makes me wonder. One of the things about reading the book and, and that discussion in the early days of of the, you know, of the populism of, of left and right not being left and right, that we're just yeah. two different ways of approaching it, not the way we see the spectrum today. Um, and, and that a lot of the things that were done were non-ideological. They were actually yeah. pragmatic and yeah. reflected uh, values. But boy, we seem to be going the other way uh, on all political fronts, the U.S. and, you know, in our own country. Is there any lesson here we can take? You know, you know that's hard to... to uh, determine. And I, I think, and again, Pam, you know this better than anybody. I think the change in media, the rise of social media has been so unbelievably corrosive to mm -hmm. the political process and to the ability for us to build consensus on things and actually have rational dialogues. I mean, it, it, we've become so isolated in our silos, right? That we mm -hmm. could no longer really have that kind of coming together in a, you know, uh, everything it becomes a fight to the death almost, right? And there's no even middle. inside parties when you witness leadership battles. Yeah, yeah the exactly. things that are said to one another are yeah. most irreparable. You know, unreparable. yeah. There's absolutely no middle ground, and it's ironic because I think the majority of Canadian people are in the middle. Yeah, that's not to say there aren't people on the left and right. You know, the yeah. the extremes there are. You know, who have very strongly held views. And they're very vociferous and loud, and it tends to it tends to overtake the national conversation, yeah. you know. And people get intimidated by it. And those kind of in the center, the pragmatists that we've been talking about, are almost you know they'd rather not engage. But that's what's them. happened to to the profession that both you and I spent a lot of years yeah. in too, not just social media that. Everybody, and we can cite all the factors, you know, everybody now has six platforms that they have to perform on every yeah. day and there's yeah. no time for research. But but increasingly people go for the extremes that, and say, here's the debate, when in fact that's not the debate. The debate is in the middle. It's not out here on the extremes. But that's it's right. a, it's an easy way to do your news piece or write your column. Well, yeah, and, and those extremes of left and right, they drive the news agenda now. Yeah. Right. Uh, that uh, that's what, you know, attracts people to the, the conflict, you know, the ones who engage in social media. Yeah. You know, and the majority of people don't. But yeah, the ones that's who, the thing. <laughs> yeah. But the ones who do, uh, you know, are, are the ones who have sort of the megaphones. Right. Yeah. And it drowns everything else out. And I can't help but think if there was a, a, a political leader who 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 emerged and spoke to sort of our common values as people, right? We all want the same kind of thing, um, you know, in terms of a better life and whatnot. And there are things that unite us. And actually, Brad Wall was very good at this. Yeah. He, he spoke in terms of uh, Saskatchewan values all the time. But when he had a policy announcement, he would always link it to what he saw as kind of the core values of Saskatchewan people, and he would mm -hmm. list them off. And, and so you would get, you know, the reaction would be, you would hear him say this about these common values. And you would say, yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. Those are the kind of values I believe in. And he would attach them, them to the policy prescription that he's put in yeah. place, right? Uh, and I think that's the kind of, uh, we need a voice of the center 
That was very clear. It was every action or piece of legislation was about what was in the public interest, the province's interest, not the party's interest. Although, of course, it was going to be in the party. But that's not how we sold it. Yeah, That's right. Yeah, and I thought it was uh, uh, very effective. And and that's the kind of uh, political rhetoric that we lack and we actually need. And you know it's being fought out now in the in the, the conservative leadership race, right? Yeah. You'll see what happens there in terms of uh, whether there can be a middle ground that emerges, because that's really what this is about. This leadership race. Yeah, and so many people say that, Dale. Um, I I just really enjoyed this book. I wish I could hold up a copy, but I read it online. So you hold up your copy so people can see what it looks like. Yeah. Okay. When they go into stores and do it there, we'll get the shot from yeah. left to right. Yeah, from left to right. It's right. Uh, University of Regina Press. Anyways, that's that, the book. So people can find it. I'm yeah. going to end just with, because uh, Kevin Page is a, a guy I really have a lot of time for, the yeah. former parliamentary budget officer of Canada, and he has done a quote for your book. He says, a very important book on the process of political change. It is history looking for answers in all the right places, a must read for Canadians struggling to understand the evolution of political leadership and the influence in our lives, which is, I think you've just so nicely summed up here about what Canadians are are looking for. So thank you for uh, for this book and for the work you've put into it. Well, thank you very much, Pamela. I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you and and, uh, your your listeners or viewers. (laughs) And uh, just on Kevin Page, wonderful guy who I used to work with and- uh, Uh, so uh, I, I appreciate you quoting him. That was nice. Yeah, it was it was good. And I'll see you soon because our paths keep crossing. Yeah, yeah. Look, <laughs> that's right. And now that the pandemic appears to be slowly subsiding, maybe we'll yeah. uh, see each other before long. We might even see each other face to face. That's great. Congratulations, Dale. Thanks so much. Thank you, Pamela. Dale Eisler from Regina this morning. And that's it for No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. We'll talk soon.